that moment when you say something negative about someone's favorite game and they are just keyboard warrioring you. Hey, it's Chris. Let's go. Crowdfunding roundup. New this week. What's hot? Why is it on the list? Brief overviews, my impressions, and a little bit of everything else thrown along the way. You ready? Let's go. Last full week of October. Yes, we are starting with Root, and I am seriously tempted by this. I shouldn't be tempted by this. I don't play my Root physical board game enough to justify this. And yet, here I find myself still wanting it. Because, again, the core pledge of this, the $50 pledge, is actually pretty significant. And even the higher ones, which we're talking about, are as good, even though I'm not sure they're as good as at least initially appeared to me. And this is the Homeland expansion. This is offering you three new factions. My pressure point, though, is that I'm not sure this is going to be any easier to get into than some of the other expansions. You know, Marauders is the one to get into for me as a little bit of a, you know, novice and a little bit easier at the lower player counts. Homeland expansion here is giving us the Twilight Council, the Lilypad Diaspora, and the Knaves of the Deepwood. Twilight Council is going to be card manipulation. Lilypad is using warriors, but to create peace, not war. And then Knaves allows you to play as basically three Vagabonds and mix and match with the other Vagabonds as a whole. Basically, your scoundrels, scoundrels, rebels, uh, outlaws style of things. And with this, you're getting a new deck to replace the original deck, Squires and Disciples, as well as more hirelings for the bats and the frogs and neutral farmers. This is the pledge level that I think is very interesting. I don't honestly have the greatest sense of how good of a value this is when we're talking about value, right? This, I think, is a really good value even if you include shipping, you know, because of the core base which is going to be a little bit uh then these two are probably going to be the push it over the edge value wise because what this is is this is the 50 dollars pledge plus 150 dollars of credit in the pledge manager the tricky part is and they show you if you blow this up this product line what is going to be available kind of what does what how things interact great for lower player count great for higher player count i love this though all the expansions except for riverfolk are good for lower and higher player counts I'm not sure if that's fully there. I'm sure some of you root aficionados have more opinions along those lines. And then I think down further, they actually lay right here some of the prices. And if this is the price in the pledge manager, that's where I get a little wishy-washy, right? Because $150 of credit gets you $60 base game, the Riverfolk expansion, and the Underworld expansion, which you're going, Chris, actually, that's not that bad. But when I price that out, those three over on Board Game Oracle before this video, those three total up $100. So then it's kind of a, a break even, $150 for those three and the new stuff. O okay, that's, you know, what the $100 at retail and the $50. So it's kind of splitting hairs then that way. But routinely, the hiring boxes are, you know, somewhere between like $13 and $17. Uh, and most of the expansion decks are a little bit harder to get. So this might be the harder to get thing. But I'd say it's kind of a push in that sense. So that's going to be your question mark gameplay is not going to be included though is the clockwork expansions because they're out of print and then they run you through kind of what i mentioned the three different factions here and they're going to be having a weekly reveal in terms of the print and play kits or the online that they have offered in the past so if you really want to try it out that is where you're going to get your money's worth from that aspect of things political connections with the twilight council you're going to be progressing your mission changing edicts and manipulating your enemies incentives the diaspora here you're training warriors to ensue though that the safety does not turn into outright aggression and again, I am not the person to break down the individual mechanics. Go check out Lord of the Board. He's got a preview video. I trust him to give you all more than what you would need to make a decision on this one. And then Knaves, again, like I said, using three Vagabond characters and Meeples at once. Three to include different combinations that you want to later on. I didn't mention the two new maps. One of them going to be expandable to more than five players. And then the Gorge, which is the one uh, Lord of the Board created, uh, has choke points and concentrating warfare into the big central areas. So it's going to come with the hirelings that are going to adapt this if you have the previous hirelings. And then the previously mentioned Squires and Disciples deck, which swaps out just like the Exiles and the Partisans deck uh, for the deck in the base game. The add-ons, the extra deluxifications here if you want. So 
There are the previews, the links are all there if you click on them. And, you know, I'd make the argument, though, that this isn't the, the one to get in on necessarily. You, you go buy a base game, you buy someone who didn't like this war game in the first place and buy their small bundle on the secondary market for even less than what it would be at retail with like the core and the river folk at this point or the core and Marauder. You can do it. You can find it. And so that's why you maybe late pledge this and go for anything else. But I, you know. Gosh darn it, leader. You know, I have to go back and look at new foundations again and see whether I'm not going to like pledge that. And now I'm looking at this one. I did not need that. But speaking of things that are my ilk, Mad Kala. Now, it's got like a tenth, literally, of root, but this is much more my speed and my ease to get to the table. You are taking the Wonderlands War from Druid City Games. You're giving it a Mankala mechanic with two sides of the board as you manipulate shards into pods, and then you're going to be trying to take that. Essentially, what you've got is on this board, you've got six different plates on each side, and you're going to be manipulating your shards and other people's shards, because what you do is you take from one of your plates and you go around, and then the last pod that you place a shard into as you start to place them clockwise around you take the action and then you have two follow actions essentially that are going to be available to you as well one that may cost and then one that is a common based card action and you have minions that you're going to be manipulating and you're going to be just even doubling the actions that are available to you if you have a doubling shard but the shards that are present on the board in the first place are also your currency for those extra actions that i mentioned and so you're going to be having to take them off but you can only grab from shards that are on your side and so if there are no shards on your side or if there's very limited shards on your side then you're going to have to potentially use your turn to place shards back down after you've spent them no stretch goals pre-stretch i mean say what you will you know if you're getting two little character expansions here with the deluxifications the quote-unquote value is there and that's what i said you know what is going to be in the incentive realistically it's the playmat it's the playmat with the chips. So I don't need the insert. And these are the little factions you're going to get here. I guess they've already decided. It's like Tweedle. They voted on it in the first couple of days, I think, along those lines. Caterpillar, Tweedle. That's going to be where your value is because I'd make the argument that this, even though it's going for, what, $45 deluxified? I thought it was $40. I was wrong. $45 there. You know, how much is shipping down here at the bottom? Well, we'll see. But two $9 expansions for a $28 to $30 game at retail. So two nine dollars, that's eighteen, you know, forty-eight plus or minus shipping. So it's it's gonna be it's gonna be you know very splitting hairs. And if that twenty-eight to thirty dollar one doesn't come with the deluxifications, then yes, monetarily wise, it would make sense to do that. So it runs you through all of that that I just mentioned, and basically going until you take your opponent out. The rulebook is right there. It's like six pages. It runs you through all the components. You don't need to see any of that. You can check out any of the videos if you really want to see how it plays. And there you go. That's that's what it is. Now, some of you are going to comment on the $10 pledge manager access. I I don't know, right? I feel like it's one of those where I don't mind it. You know, I don't like it when it creeps up, but it also makes you not fence straddle, right? It makes you be more definitive on it. And you're probably going to say, though, at the same time, it's probably going to turn people off that, you know, would have backed it for $1. You know what? How many times do you just let that $1 go? Or are you one person that always upgrades that $1? Well, this is just going to make you get off the fence, right? Blank or get off the pot. I, I don't care. If you want to get all the other stuff for Wonderland's War, you can as well. Uh, you know, the thing I need, actually, I need the upgraded, you know, little uh, replacement faction boards. That's actually the thing I need because I never got that replaced uh, the first time around, the second time around. So $12 for that, you know, okay, $57. Yeah, I mean, it's deluxified. I, I don't look at it anything different. It's going to be a value thing one way or the other. And this sort of reminds me similarly to uh, earlier in the month of Emberleaf. I think the value, quote unquote, is there. I think the monetarily, you're going to be about a break even whatever side of things. But whether or not it's your view of value, that's where I think you guys are going to let me know in the comment section and splice hairs because I don't look at this necessarily as a bad price. I look at it as the price of deluxification now in crowdfunding. So there you go. Raising Robots is back. I actually remember covering this one uh, previously because I remember having to watch Rado and, and look through his stuff to figure out what was going on. This is like a spin of what does they say? Like Wingspan meets Race for the Galaxy, if you will. Engine build, insert generic engine builder here, plus Race for the Galaxy. A little bit more along the lines of like an Ares expedition to me in that sense. And it's got $50,000. It's coming back. It's giving you a deluxified version, again, with a new expansion, a go on top of the previous Pets expansion the first time around. The new expansion is Friends. And you take a five 
phase action system where you are laying down two of the cards just like a race for the galaxy type vibe of those two phases that you want to accomplish on your turn and then if there are energy cubes any energy cubes in those areas you get to take them but you also get to take any cards for sure that you laid down additionally simultaneous play in the same regard as you go through you're assembling you're building your robots you're gathering your resources and you're managing like i think six or so as a whole resources in order to build said robots that i just mentioned upgrade your efficiency of your board and then take your victory point march towards the inevitable end after i believe eight rounds if i recall correctly again simultaneously you're going to be revealing it's going to reveal how many total cubes or energy spots are available in each different phase because then you can split them up between the phases of how you want to allocate them whether it's upgrading or building those robots like i mentioned unlocking further actions that are going to be more beneficial as you go along like any good engine builder this is a relatively succinct uh you know overview in terms of how to play i actually recommend it the rule book is a little bit a, a little bit more complicated and so for this one for me i definitely got it better visually than i did reading rule books you know like it's the difference between being able to read a rule book like i did for mad Kala there and be able to you know visualize how it's going to work versus having sometimes you know not watching a video in that sense but having the rule book and actively playing it out on the table in front of me some games i need the playing it out in front of me some games i can just read it and then play it out separately and so this one was a watch from that aspect of things uh deluxe edition here it's going to give you the bling that you're looking for as well there and then the pets expansion here gives you more asymmetric pets that you're going to be um, having available at your disposal here free copies included they say in the deluxe edition in the first place which also includes inventors uh, because you get to activate other robot cards as well. So, I mean, awesome. Friends expansion here, offering three new modules, more robots, more inventors, and then competitions and friendships, uh, shared objectives that you can utilize as a way to score more points. So everything is on this page. Everything is there that you need to know. The new second edition, though, expansion for Friends is going to be a little bit upgraded. And then the Friends Plus, so first and second edition expansions in case you didn't get it. And then the all-in, again, $90. I mean, it's about what I'd expect at this point now seeing all of this stuff. So... Yeah, I mean, it's a great small engine build game and it probably needs more attention, but is it appealing to you and does it have quite the dynamic you're looking for? Well, give it a look-see and tell them Leech sent you. Smurfs, the role-playing game, <laughs> almost as much as Mod Kala. If you told me Smurfs with this was going to get as much as Mod Kala, I would have looked at you cross-eyed or sideways before this, right? 114 grand. And the reason we're covering it is because there's actually a board game associated with it. What does the board game do? How does the board game work? I have no idea. You can quick start the RPG here though, if you really want to. Basically you build a Smurf by choosing your attributes and choosing their adjective as their word. You got four different attributes here and you have each unique advantages or motivations that's gonna go along with them and a little equipment. You're rolling dice. You're rolling dice to see whether or not you do it and you succeed. Smurfing effort on the Smurfing video here. The problem is, and when we go down here, we get to finally some of the pledge levels and you can see like the board game is included like right there. But what's the board game as a whole? I have no idea. And if you want to buy the board game, you can down here right there for $40. But I don't see where the board game is any more details. So if you want a Smurfs board game, give it a look-see. And that's why we're talking about RPGs because it's adjacent today. And this is Thunder Road Vendetta RPG. And we'll mention it even though it has half the amount that Smurfs does. Again, Smurfs, $100,000. What the deuce, man? I guess nostalgia for the 80s and, or, you know, early 90s whatever is there so you want to roll a die and represent yourself as a car in that way well you can because like it says here your role is your role that's a cute dad pun uh i'm not going into it any other you know details but if you want to rpg it up as a thunder road you know vendetta maximum chrome edition style whatever give it a look see next up we're hopping over to game found almost half a million dollars bard song is back from steam forge and you're getting a one to five player dungeon crawl that is procedurally generated, meaning the map layout is going to be different every single time as you go your questing, side questing, and upgrading RPG style with this reiteration, different thematic incorporation of Bardsung originally. Now, I like this quote, 
there's fresh to adventure and there's a new song on the wind the problem is th there's not a whole lot on the page that actually tells you what's different you can play a true solo you can play it up to five there are going to be 10 different uh scenarios linked together to form the campaign and they say remastered gameplay i i love this huge massive freaking dragon here right that looks amazing but i wish there was something on the page that said okay explicitly did you like bard song or these were the criticisms of bard song this is what we've done to bring it back 140 dollars gets you a 40 hour campaign again people are telling me that 40 hours of a game like this is not a lifestyle game lifestyle games have to be something else and so i'm just wrong on what i consider a lifestyle game even though again you know if you're waist deep in the hobby and you're someone who's picking this up casually as a first time this is going to be a lifestyle game i'm going to make that argument every single time 255 dollars two boxes monstrous black dragon what do we got here uh two expansions feudal crusade and they're 15 and the stretch goals so and deluxifications to go along with that so here we go uh taverns new tale okay vile black dragons decaying you got to bring the forest back from the brink of destruction multi-class heroes again i think these are cool these aren't your generic sort of uh you know fantasy style D D esque vibe choose your hero get your skills give your gameplay customize it that's great i mean this is very generic i, I want to see just more more details manipulating turn order intelligent combat i, I want to see what this does procedurally generated and there are two videos down here so you can see some playthrough of what it entails but i'll be frank with you guys i am not super knowledgeable about the base game it was one of those that tempted me but i ultimately said i have too many like this right now so i can't get it and so that's my question because boss battling dungeon crawl procedurally generated rpg multi-class upgrading all of those things i mean we have a type right there's a reason that this isn't just getting millions of dollars on crowdfunding from miniatures but this type of game as a whole i love the fact that the rule book is on the page though and so it gives you in the rule book a little bit more of a detailed breakdown of what you're doing on a turn by turn basis you're playing in round sort of and end style initiative order where everybody's got their initiative card and you lay them down randomly drawn in order every single round after everyone is gone rinse and repeat and on your turn you have the ability to take one of three different actions for a total of two total actions and you can mix and match however you want even doing the same action repeatedly move explore or use an ability i mean it's relatively straightforward moving from section to section exploring if you're next to an adjacent area that can be explored and put down new tiles or using your special abilities using your combat using all of those things the enemy ai system is going to be very like D, &D vibe esque in terms of battling these enemies rolling your dice as well as bloodying them and changing how they're going to be going after you from an ai standpoint i mean it's very D, &D esque if i pull up what you've got going on here except you're rolling like two d6s as it says over here on the left side upper left right here with a different attack attack effects conditions empowering attacks how the enemy is going to be attacking and defending as well as how you're going to be spawning them having little challenges and events occur by a card play as you're going along wandering monsters as well as fate that's going to be a resource available to you to allow you some mitigation manipulation and of course the all well powerful treasure cards here are what you're searching for in the first place to make your people more powerful there is a maintenance phase or an upkeep or an upgrade session in between each encounter counter where you can not only upgrade your skills but also get your loot and if you fail it you get to do this anyway so that you can go back to it and see if you can beat it mini bosses as well as bosses and how they differ from the main minions in the first place relatively straightforward rule book like it from that aspect but that's the question you have to ask yourself right if this wasn't the one you got in on last time is this doing stuff differently enough for you this time if you looked at it last time and you said i love this is this a 2.0 version and then down here we get to the gameplay extras and the non-gameplay extras the upgrade pack we just passed by the extra wandering monster which is a boss which is uh the free follow gift and then the feudal crusade which again is a whole nother like mini episode 15 hours of gameplay they said with a new boss as well play mats additional pledges and all of the unlocks that you're getting here and a little bit of choosing as you go here are the two videos that i mentioned whoops there's actually three and the miniatures if you're looking from that as a miniature junkie so there you go steam forge putting out another bard song is it going to change your mind on it that's the big question so there you go then we're going avatar journey of ang i covered it earlier this week 132 thousand dollars this is a one to four player sort of race driven card aspect resource dice situation 
And let me explain that there for a second, because what you've got going here from Bad Crow, which previously did Company of Heroes, right? Like Company of Heroes to Avatar The Last Airbender. That is a wide spectrum of stuff. But you can see here what you have is the world of Avatar on a map, and you're trying to traverse your bison. Yeah, you're flying bison. You're getting Appa as you go across with a press your luck vibe of seeing how far you can move. That's going to affect your press your luck resources that are needed in order to achieve that uh, distance or that, you know, situation as a whole. And that is represented by the cards that are going to be on your tableau in combination with the mastery that you get from manipulating those cards in the first place, because as you're laying them, they're going to have value contributing to your skill in a specific element. But then as you lay them on top of previously laying cards, those previously laid cards will actually rotate. And if you rotate them enough, they get taken off the board, which may decrease your skill, but increase your overall mastery, which stays permanent, which then can be used to buy upgraded dice and achieve conditions that will allow you to eventually get even better dice in the form of the avatar dice as you go along. There are several different spots along the board, three tiers of enemies or challenges that you can do that are going to give you high risk, high reward. They are much more difficult in terms of the elemental mastery that you need in order to achieve them, but they actually give you significantly better bonuses and benefits. And that's the game in a nutshell. You're trying to get to the end before you run through the deck of cards that proceeds and pushes the Comet towards the end track to beat Fire Lord Ozai before he turns into Super Mega Super Saiyan Fire Lord Ozai and his stats go up and you only have one shot instead of, well, a couple potentially to do that. It's upgraded, it's deluxified. You can get a little, well, actually I like the neoprene mat board there. Non-bender expansion, uh, I didn't mention, but you each get two individual characters in order to get extra dice. So you're actually rolling eight dice per turn, six core dice plus two that are special or unique to your character. So it's gonna be very tactical based in terms of what is on the board when you go, because I didn't even mention that the market of cards that's available to you if you ever have more than two of the same type of resource card or elemental card out there in the first place, it wipes the market. And so there's going to be things like that that are going to be, uh, you know, maybe make it or break it for you as a whole. So all the stuff that I mentioned there, the companion cards, the upgrades, the upgrades, the upgrades. So again, it's a very nice family weight. If you want to make it really hard, you can. Hey, look, there's my video. Uh, and then everything else to go along with it. And I think it's just doing something kind of neat. It's doing something different I haven't seen. But is it for you? That's what you have to ask yourself. Next up, The Maniac, $200,000. And you're gonna go, Chris, this is another one of those horror games with like the theme pasted on. No, this one actually, surprisingly, looks quite clever from a dynamics, potentially a little bit of take that with just a minor smidge of hidden movement style of things. Because you're gonna be playing the role of survivors. And I guess I'd look at this and you're gonna have probably more people is gonna make this one better. So when it says one to six, I think four is probably the minimum number after having read through the rule book that I would want in this. And let me show you, or at least tell you why that is the case and so what you've got going on here is a survival game as someone one of the players turns into the maniac you basically don't have the maniac decided at the beginning of the game this is not a predetermined one versus all style of things because as you're going through the beginning phase of the game you get these welcome cards and so when someone finally obtains the welcome card that is the mask they turn into the maniac and then the maniac can switch people if you defeat the maniac before a certain time in the game it actually gets taken away and gathered by somebody else. So somebody else has the chance to win as the maniac in that regard. And what happens though, is as you're killed, that actually gets you closer to the end game in a positive way if you're the survivors as well, because as you're killed, the first time somebody's killed, they become the sheriff. The second time they become a predestined. The third time they get cameos, additional characters that are going to be beneficial in different ways. And only the predestined or the sheriff aforementioned after somebody dies and becomes them can finally eliminate the maniac for goodsies. But the predestined can also switch teams depending on which side is doing better. But as soon as they choose a side, they are stuck on that side. And the other element of things that you're going to be doing as you move across like this house type area here is that you are going to be doing it in sort of an action programming style of things depending on your terror level. If you are terrified, you lose some of the action tokens that are available to you in your collection. But on a turn by turn basis, if they're all available to you or however many are, you're going to be pre-programming three of them to do when the next phase occurs. Now you can play, as it says here, two or more survivors versus the Maniac Gamut. Now you can play it in other game modes like it says here single player here with two or more survivors against the game standard and one of them become the maniac or if you really want just to be someone the maniac you can do that too but i think the crazy chaotic chris way oh that's a ccc not a kkk no no kkk's here none 
and you can do the ccc way here standard mode and i think that would be the way i would prefer to do it so uh it gives you just a little bit of everything along that side you're going to be drawing items trying to gather the items you need to have on the board in the first place found in order to well defeat the maniac as the sheriff for the predestined like i mentioned or you have one of four different escape routes which are also going to require different items to be found in the first place you're going to be maneuvering around this house trying to hide trying to gather items trying to search and explore while not knowing where the maniac is because the maniac is going to secretly write down the number of the room that they're traversing to and so if you happen to pass through it then you will have to potentially fight or get away all of these characters have asymmetric powers that are going to be available to them three cards that you're going to be utilizing then if you become the maniac you flip them to their opposite side the maniac themselves though actually has sort of a passive and aggressive states uh and that's represented by the mask that you'll see uh the maniac wearing here on the passive side of things the actions are lesser but as soon as they get hit once then they switch to the more aggressive much meaner much more difficult sheriff predestined tommy that i mentioned there as well standard edition is going to get you miniatures as well as standees there oh i didn't realize they were both in there collector's edition is going to glow in the dark i mean this is kind of cool though i'm not a big aesthetic table person presence i'm not a big aesthetic like table presence person but this is kind of cool with the 3d tower there i worry about functionality of getting you know set up and tear down and put away but i do like the idea of it if nothing else so uh there you go a new mechanic with events here if you get the director's cut is that locked though behind the extra money as a mechanic. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but uh, you know, if it's not great, if it is, oh, uh, well, you know, I think you'd be okay with not uh, as many mechanics as a whole. So I, I like the idea of this. This is just like uh, Chaosmos, if you remember that. It gives me Chaosmos type vibes, only with like the horror side of things. And so again, after reading through the rule book and looking through this page, I really see why now they've got $200,000 raised. So give it a look. See, if we go down here, we get to the stretch goals because they're all the way down there with a little bit of extra gameplay content, a little bit of luxifications. Rule books there. You got a few videos in addition. So that's all available to you. And, you know, shipping is going to be whatever it's going to be, although it is kind of expensive to be fair so what is the core pledge here with this one standard edition is 65 and 90 i mean that's 30 dollars. i mean that's all, all about 50 percent of the price of you know the core pledge here as the ship so i mean again you're probably gonna do the collector if anything but give it a look see much much better than i was initially thinking so i give them kudos they're doing something kind of cool there then we're going back over to kickstarter stephen feld's latest two nine and ten uh you know i remember this was like four and it was a huge thing and it was well uh, announced in advance of uh, one two even and we're at almost two hundred thousand dollars here and you're getting chichen itza as well as valencia valencia is a remake of a 2011 game from stephen feld of strasburg and chichen itza is a new one and it's a new dynamic it's a new like sort of mechanic i don't see him using in a bunch of his games although i'm not quite the stephen feld aficionado or expert as a whole but essentially what you've got is you've got this grid-based tile hex selection and what you're going to be doing is you're going to be allocating your troops in order to essentially uh, achieve objectives and knock out monsters using die rolling. But the action mechanic selection of how you're going to be doing that in the first place, how you're going to be paying for it, and how you're going to be utilizing them is this lower right hand corner selection board that will blow up here in a second that you can kind of see. I actually really love these acrylic sandies. Truth be told, boy, howdy, those are cool looking. Oh man, those are cool looking. Wood upgrades, everything else you'd expect from uh, the previous Queen editions to match it. And it does come with an expansion box here as well. I don't remember seeing what the expansion added, but just a little bit more of everything is what it looks like. And as they're known for their queenies. So, which can be completely cool or completely miss, uh, depending on which game they are, how essential they are. And what you're going to see here is it's going to be a modular setup that you can redo every time in a different way. And you'll see that there's a row and a column that is a number correlating to the spot that you are putting down. And you get to take the lower of the two because that's the cost of the action in the first place. But if someone else wants to play, they have to take the higher action. And they can only take one action once. And then you rinse and repeat as you're putting all four of these down there, upgrading your actions along the gears that are going to be available to you to upgrade your actions along the way. And then seven different types of creatures that you're going to be fighting that you may not know exactly what their special combinations or their health are going to be. The gameplay example that they actually give is like, you know, when you go to fight this creature, your dice actually only may be the opposite of what you're used to, right? Where uh, in this sense, the uh, hit die for this creature or the alligator that they talk about in the example is that it's, uh, you know, one to hit and anything higher than a one doesn't hit. So you upgrade it and then it becomes like a one and a two or a one, two and a three 
that do damage. And then there are three different types of attacks. Like you've got your special, you've got your ranged, and then you've got your melee. The special is like whatever the magic cards are that you play or the elemental cards that you can play that modify it. The ranged then is a separate. And then the melee is solely based on the dice being how many troops you're moving in the first place. And so that's going to be the rinse and repeat. And as you complete these, knock these guys out, they're all going to complete different objectives that you may be uh, utilizing or going in the first place. And here they run you through exactly what I just said. Magic phase, combat phase uh, with the ranged and then the melee. Rolls are happening simultaneously as you're checking both uh, the offensive as well as the defensive because if they hit you, you just lose troops and you go until somebody can't go. And that's it. Rinse and repeat. So six rounds of that and you go until somebody is done and somebody's the winner at the end. I think it actually looks kind of clever. I, I'm not... You know, sure, though, because I am a, you know, area majority takeover sort of situation like that person who is a try before buy because that mechanic is very hit or miss with me. Uh, again, not going to say that I'm good at it. I'm horrible at it across the board, but which ones I enjoy and which ones I don't enjoy, I just can't tell off surface value. So give the gameplay a look-see and they break down what all's in each of those. So you can check that out if you want. And then we get down here to Valencia and Valencia is a three to five player. Although again, they say that now they've adapted it to a two player variant auction bidding style game again with an area majority vibe. And so what you've got here is you've got sort of rounds that you are going to be bidding. So in the base game of Strasbourg, there are five rounds with seven bidding auctions in each round and so essentially what you do is you use card driven bids to you know from a 24 card deck that you were given originally again and i'm not sure what's different here but that is the basis of then using those cards and once you run them out over the five rounds you're out so you have to choose how many of them you're going to be doing and it has like numbers one two three four and five and so you can combine cards together you can leave them solo what do you think is going to get what and if you win you win you get more resources you get more people but you have to pay not only the bidding cards in order to win you have to then pay resources or you know money in order to place them down onto the grid in the first place that is going to be how you're going to be scoring your victory points because there are going to be little edifices on the board that are going to be scoring victory points there's objectives that are going to be scoring victory points and you're going to be gathering goods from those spaces in the first place in order then to cash them in during other parts of the auction or the bidding round rounds so that you can sell them to get the money to be able to place your little workers in the first place very cyclical nature in that way but none of that unfortunately is on the page i had to go look up strasburg over on board game geek and read some reviews to actually get any sense of that so the problem is it doesn't show you anything of what's different here with valencia they only give the basic description which is the same as it is on board game geek saying that there's a new two-player variant and there's just some additional different stuff as a whole so uh that's it right there's there you go. Artwork, new task cards, updated round structures, new edifices there, if I can spit that one out. But are you enamored with this? Do you have one through eight? Do you have yet all one through eight? That's the other question. So give it a look-see. Then, Kanata, the first sacrament. Now you're going, Chris, didn't we just cover one of these horror games? Yes. And truth be told, off of first glance, the other one appeals much more to me, but it's going to be much more chaotic and much more random. This one is going to be a little bit more controlled, but it's going to be a little bit more simple in, in that sense. And so again, it's sort of which one of the sides of the coin do you want in that sense? Because what you're doing here is you're controlling, uh, you know, three different phases, essentially, of these characters as you're traversing around the town, trying to avoid the abomination, trying to avoid the sheriff who's trying to capture you and steal all your items and eventually then reaching the end by getting through the hellish roadblock to make your escape after you gather the items that you need in the first place as you roll and move and that's essentially what it is you roll and move one or two dice and depending on the number of dice you use that is also the dice that the enemies are going to use on their turn and you use those dice to not only move on the map as you saw with the big map up here but then you also use that to traverse your individual player board as the secondary action of things followed by the tertiary is moving the bad guys so so the first phase of things, like I said, is you're moving your character on the map, then you move around the outside, and this is going to determine what happens where, if you're inside or outside on the big board, then it's going to change things down here. But then the third part of this is going to be the optional action, sort of like 2B, if you will, where you can fight off enemies that are getting near to you. You can search if you're inside or outside at these locations, trying to find what you need, 
or you can get special abilities or other interactions with NPCs that are going to either aid you or, well, get in your way. And then lastly, you're going to move the Sheriff and or the Abomination based on those dice that you moved in the first part. And both of these can traverse the map a little bit differently. You have those side passages here that the Abomination can get through that you can be in. The Abomination can also go into the places. The Sheriff and the car can only go on the main streets and cannot get into the locations or the little side streets. Uh, the Abomination turns you into another Abomination. So you flip your whole player board over and you become going after your players or your fellow players. I should say. And the sheriff just moves you to the B&B &B and you lose all your items that you may have gathered. So you win by gathering the items you need and escaping. That's the game in a nutshell. Uh, watch this five minute video. That's how I found out about it and how it plays. So you can check that out as a whole. So again, just more straightforward, more simple than the other. Uh, but which side of the coin do you prefer? A little bit of expansion content to go along with it here gives you more events, more pieces, more standees and more puzzle fragments as well to make it just a little bit bigger. So that is it. And you can give it a look. See if I can scroll back up to the top here. Kanata. Empire Builder Europe. This is like a train pickup and deliver style game. So you know my overview of this is going to be relatively brief because my mind does not work well with this. But the dynamic that's giving you a little bit different uh, that I am not completely familiar with in this Empire Builder is you are a train moving across most of Europe and you are getting a revamped version of this as you connect all of these tiny little dots. And so there's about three or so, I believe, different terrains on there that are each going to cost you different values of money to connect. You're going to be picking up and delivering goods from various sites dropping them off at major cities and trying to earn money that way to earn 250 million they say although it's all in increments of millions so uh really 250 but you start off with 50 in order to get your train rolling oh he did it and so that's going to be what you're going to be doing the demand cards the demand cities where you can pick up the goods where you can get them sort of a ticket to ride-esque vibe i'm losing that comparison very loosely just in the sense that you've got two cities and you know you where you need to go and where you need to get so that's really what it is more than anything else you get just upgraded a little everything else trinkets though and i think it says you're actually using crayons right yeah you use crayons to connect these spots as your well connection like it says you have a 12 speed chip so 12 speed is literally moving between 12 dots here you can upgrade that to 60 you start out with three cards here that are going to tell you where you need to go and how you need to do it and you build your track using the increments of 20 million at a time. So uh, there you go. You play your game, you play your turns, you upgrade, you improve, and you pick up and deliver those goods as you go across. So it's, it's killing it right now. So uh, not my type of game at all. Like I, I would play this and I would do really horrible and I might have fun with it, but this is never a game I would buy just because I am like absolutely atrociously, my mind does not work this way at all, but I love seeing it and it's $50,000 and there you go. Next, we're going to Me Bunnies, then thinking more like their root, but actually more like Vast, if you're familiar with that, where you've got these asymmetric six little Me Bunnies, uh, you know, sort of squishy little amorphous bunnies that each have different objectives, different cell sheets, different rules, setups of things they're going to be trying to accomplish in the six different colored area regions here. And that is majorly going to be done by the use of these colored cards as you draw three of them at the beginning of the game and will utilize them as as many actions as you choose to do with them on a turn by turn basis each of these has asymmetry in terms of how they're going to be trying to deliver or achieve their end game goals and so how you prefer to interact which one you prefer to do and how much interaction with your fellow compatriots is going to be the question here for example roy is an entrepreneur he delivers flowers he has a limitation if he can move five spaces on his turn as an action but he then has to go to a place where one of his tokens is play a card that matches the location color and then flip it over once it's flipped over then he can deliver that token to the correct spot on the board he has to do that i believe with either five or six tokens before the end of the game the orange piece here for example is divided into multiple and they have to gather all of their pieces together in order to win and so those are going to be the differences between the characters as themselves and depending on if you want to get a little extra there are also three additional ones here that they outline that are included in the expansion this has sleeper hit written all over it now i guess the only thing i would wonder here as they're laying these out in terms of how you're going to be giving unique differences and they actually give you the unique difference uh rules here as a separate sheet so you can really tell right the actions the movement the complexity right it really is more of a vast as a whole of just 
how interacting are you going to be on the board? That's my main question that I uh, need to look a little bit more into. The rule book doesn't really give you as much of that, just that you're going to be drawing these cards, playing these cards, getting the little jellies in order to mitigate or move a little extra further or take a little extra action. So, I mean, it gives me those vibes and it just it's just kind of cool. So I think this would be a nice sort of vast level for a family friendly version, if you will. And I can see why it's getting the funding that it is in that sense. So $39 gets you the base game and the stretch goals. $59 gets you the base game with the expansion. $89 is sold out because that would get you uh, some other freebies to go along with it. So I didn't even know about this one. I didn't have a clue about it. You can see me watching some video content there. The general rules are there as well, but then the individual character rules, as I mentioned, delivering the flowers in Roy's case, and then Cam's rules of getting the stacks and trying to get all the stacks into one space. It gives you all of these different little, very piecemealed objective vibes, as well as the individual rule sheets on the page. So this one actually has me putting it on my wish list now because I'm actually relatively impressed by this one. So if this looks halfway decent to you, um, yeah, give them a look-see. I'm me bunnies. There you go. Then going back to a name you probably haven't heard for a while, Stone Circle, who made one of my most underrated games of all time, Battle for Baternia. I'm still looking for Pixelvania expansion. You know what? I got to try and find me a copy of that. But we're talking about Burned Redux, and this is the second time around because they didn't fund the first time. And it's worth giving a look-see as an asymmetric head-to-head -head dueling style sort of hidden movement bluffing-esque game. One side of things, you are the burned agent. On the other side, you are the agent C. The agency has a director as well as, I think, six additional agents in the form of cards that you will be using to explore the various locations that are color adjacent. And what that means is the agent, the burned agent, will be hiding at one of these locations, utilizing their asymmetric kit of one of many different options that they will have in order to tailor how they are going to try to, well, kill the director in the first place, but they don't know which one is the director, and that's the director's misdirection of having multiple agents face down, not knowing who is who. Now, both of them can get revealed if they're moving too fast between locations, meaning if you're moving between locations that are the same color, you do not get revealed. If you move from a yellow to a yellow or a purple to a purple or a blue to a blue in that adjacency, I think there might actually be also letter adjacency as well, not spatial arrangement in that case. And they make that a very clear point on the page and in the rules. So you can set it up on the table however you can fit it. But if you do not do that, you can span obviously larger ranges of things than what it may offer you otherwise, but you have to flip over and reveal either as the agent revealing what color you are going to, or as the agent C, which agent it is that is moving to that area. If you are the agents, you are searching to try and find the burned agent in order to take him out. If you are the burned agent, you are using your gun to aim at the director and kill the director. Last one standing wins. And I want to see this one get funded. Uh, it's only a little bit over a third of the way funded at this point. As a two-player asymmetric, it really gives me more of a Fowler Games type vibes. You know, Burgle Brothers, Fugitive, that sort of aspect. And with the asymmetry and the card-driven gameplay here, I really kind of like it. So give it a look-see. Everything is on the page. Rulebook is relatively straightforward. And the gameplay is just as straightforward as I said, too. So, so very wrong about games talked about it. And so if they liked it, again, it's not just me espousing random stuff because I'm, you know, not good at this. So give it a look-see. Stone Circle, tell them Leech sent you. Then we're going to hop over here and we're going to go over to Grinnevel. This is, although it says, you know, only a three weighting on Board Game Geek, it gives me a little bit of a feel of something slightly heavier as sort of a suburbia-esque vibe when you've got this circular grid-based system that you are building uh, buildings on, either home developments or more industrial complexes. But the main action mechanism of this is going to be your action tableau that you are going to be going around that they abbreviate as your like uh, player action board. But essentially what it is, is this modular setup of actions around the edge of this board. And it has sort of a Glenmore vibe in the way that you are moving because you get to move to whatever action you want. But you'll notice that these actions will actually have numbers on them or uh, as part of their condition, which then forces you to move additional spaces forward as part of the 
uh, time spent doing that action. However, you can, well, spend money to buy time to prevent you from having to move as far forward because the more you go around, the more progressive the game gets. And after you go around so much, then that's going to trigger the end game. And you're all going to be doing this as you progress. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that is it in a nutshell and how you're building and developing with these shared boards. I'm gonna leave the rest to you. You can check out the rule book. It's a relatively good read of about 24 pages. And you can see if this like sort of a slightly heavier suburbia in a different way gives you vibes of things that you might be looking for as a sieve or a town planner. So then after that, we get down to their other two previous games here that you can check out at the bottom as well. You can add them on separately with included expansion here, as well as additional expansion and previous expansions offered in both cases. So both standalone games, both completely different, highly interactive, and then also down here, if we get past the expansion, more of a strategic, sort of a lightweight style, constant analysis, but not analysis paralysis, two-stage round selection. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to give you any more details. The rules, though, are on the page. So if you want anything of their product line, you can give it a look-see, and you can check out whether or not this is for you. Then, Tofu Shifu nearly funded $2,000 of a $2,500 funding goal because it's a little bit of different style worker placement, uh, pick up a resource, deliver, if you will, as you're going along, using your worker to go to the different locations, similar to what we were talking about earlier with Chichen Itza from Seffenfeld, in the sense that several of these locations are going to have two different values. And if you go there, there are going to be different worker spots, but you have to pay the higher value there as you go. But then you're going to be utilizing the resources as well as the multi-use cards. And that's really the main different aspect of this game is the multi-use cards in order to convert not only having objectives, but then resources that can be utilized or rewards that can be gathered and you're going to be going along essentially uh, upgrading the paths of victory and the utilization of those resources in the first place the signboards representing here as you land your shifu there the resources that are required to pay for the action that is there via the hat costs that are available to you which can be done by gathering the hats as resources or discarding the cards that have them alongside of them taking the nine different potential actions that are available to you in terms of of the well comboing that you're going to do and rinsing and repeating so i'm going to leave it at that because you know worker placement games are not my ilk but this is doing something a little bit different and you're not going to find this at retail as well from a chinese board gamer so 30 dollars and their previous games which i had never actually heard of most of these so cooking noodles picky eaters workplace dilemma pigeon party and cubic soho pigeon party it reminds me of the pigeon from uh pig and elephant uh that book series so anyway i wanted to give it a book-see and give it a mention here so if you're interested there you go check it out then panomachia nearly funded two-thirds of the way there as well card driven aspect it's a little bit of war if we're being honest here but each of them has a little bit of an asymmetry because you have about 10 different types of gods that are going to go head to head that are each going to have powers but their power is going to also be dependent if the world or the environment card is their same uh, nature element because then they get a plus three boost but you can have beasts that are captured that will also give asymmetry and differing uh, boosts or drains depending on how that is played and then what you do is you basically capture capture other people's cards your winning tricks if you will for lack of a better thing uh there are cards i'm gonna mispronounce this word so i'll just spell it t-y-c-h-e that can manipulate the environment cards in the first place or if the winning card of the trick round is a different element than the uh card that's out there already as the environment then it changes to that one as well and so you can manipulate it in those ways 84 cards total as you divide them up and you basically uh, i think play 10 rounds of this as you're going because uh you know essentially at the higher player counts 10 cards are dealt out the art's fantastic the gameplay is uh there but if you want to actually know a little bit more of what i'm talking about the rules on the page are not the most expressive so it actually says uh we'll write down here the worlds the boosts the time Timeline. you go over to playpanomachia.com and it gives you a little bit more of a detailed breakdown there and you're probably going to need that because my explanations are subpar sometimes so uh that being said twenty dollars is going to get you the basic game and i'm going to guess you're not going to find it elsewhere but if you want to deluxify it with uh extra packaging hollows and a coin you can pay 50 so it's almost funded it'll probably fund but give it a look see if you enjoy this style of like card driven gameplay 
then Castlescape is back second edition with a gates and guilds expansion and the deluxe components if you want it because they're not going to be available otherwise and there's also an upgrade modernization pack they say to go along with it this is a combination of a deck build area control as you can see here we're just going to go back to that image because i can describe what's going on in the image to give you a little bit of a better visualization so essentially what you're doing is you're taking your cards playing your cards to recruit your little tokens onto the board then you are building walls up and around areas trying to have the most presence of your recruits around a section when it is finished in order to gain the renown or the influence from those after a turn by turn basis and then when the king comes around in a scoring opportunity that happens several times throughout the game you are going to be scoring those areas and upgrading and then resetting in a way back to whatever your corruption level is because you're going to be able to build things faster better and cheaper if you're more corrupt but it's going to behoove you not to be after these resets and so you're utilizing that in a deck building style manner and the upgrades that you're going to see are making these things just prettier bigger 50 percent they say as well as more textured and again the blown up pictures here you'll see in a second actually make it look really appealing this is one of those games that's always been on my radar but never i have had really any concrete knowledge of should i actually get this and so I give this a lot of kudos. This looks really appealing. Uh, the only question is, again, do I need a big box with a solo mode and a fifth player pack and a play mat? My answer to that is probably no. And if my answer to that is no, well, I'm not sure I need to get it on crowdfunding, but I really like the idea of what they're doing here. It gives me sort of, as they say, Carcassonne Dominion, only like with Era, if you're familiar with that game, which is like out of print or out of stock everywhere online right now. And so it's that sort of building that goes along with this. And that game was a little dry for me, but I understand why people like it from a building and now not only just having your individual board but doing that on a shared board as a whole stretch goals stretch pay i mean there's tons of video content down here at the bottom folks and it gives you a little bit more to go along with this individual asymmetric guilds to go along with more contracts more gates that you can build in a different way goals and market cards of the all the other previous that you're getting in the first place I mean, it's $59, but this is one of those that I don't think it was widely available. And again, don't listen to me because I'm pretty sure it also got the Dice Tower Seal of Excellence as the combination of things that you may like. So take that for what you will. It's just, you know, deluxified. Are you willing to pay $100 for this? And I'd be willing to go out on a limb and, you know, trade for this or buy this for like 50 bucks at retail. I'm not sure I'd spend double that sight unseen again, because I just don't know these mechanics because I could see them just like we were talking about area control earlier, that some really work for my head and some don't work in front of me on the table in terms of what my brain does. So I'm not sure how you feel about five players, but you can do that deluxified as long as you want as well. And again, the expansion content with the modernization is right here too, if you bought the first time around. And if we get down to that, it should show it here in a second. I can't remember where it is on the page. We'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, stretch goals that you're getting a little bit extra and uh, prototypes if you want as well. But it gives you a little bit of the old stuff in addition, the previous promo packs, the previous uh, sleeves and everything else that you're getting. So then it gives you the rundown, like I already mentioned, right? You're playing these cards and resolving their effects in order to gain walls and recruits, placing them to construct those areas, placing the recruits on top as you lay them down, using that money that's earned to then purchase cards and though with any of them you have to play into the back alley if you have any notorious bad ones essentially your corruption while discarding your other ones normally however if you run out you have to adjust your infamy and corruption based on the ones that you set aside rinse and repeat claiming it once it gets walled off whoever gets the most gets that little victory on the inside the inspection when the last wall is pulled then the king comes and does it then you remove your influence or recruits from the board equal to their infamy and then you get to well put it back in the corruption refill it and go again so tons and tons of content what's new here again they say powerful guild asymmetric there and do the gate tiles that are placed on the board initially there you go. I mean, giving you just more of it. And I don't think that's probably too much either. Here's the new stuff, right? Stone texture. Here's the difference. Now you can see the difference right there. So that's the conundrum always with crowdfunding. Second time around, sometimes this happens, but they're willing to make sure that you get taken care of too. So give it a look. See, wasn't kidding about all the video content. So you want a more detailed breakdown. There is tons of stuff out there. And again, I'm really surprised that this one doesn't have more, but I think it's just flying under the radar. It's one of those dark horses that does really well, but for some reason just doesn't hit mainstream. So, Cast Escape, give it a look-see.
Next up, Jisoji, I'm gonna mispronounce that, but it's an anime studio simulation type worker placement game in the lines of the other tycoon style games that you may have been familiar with. What you're doing is you're designing animes through an, a typical worker placement with a twist style. You're gonna be having action cards based on the workers of the anime studio of four different types that are gonna be upgradable, that are gonna be a little bit of deck you know, building-esque that you're going to be slowly gathering in order then to incorporate the three different parts of the anime that are required in order to produce it, which is your main way of earning victory points through the seven potential different actions that are going to be available to you. It's really funny because they describe even the four workers that you start off with, each of the one of the four types, as burnt out or dead inside, and you can actually upgrade them and get them back to working better and stronger like some of the other ones that are going to be asymmetric and available to you uh, throughout the game by you know improving them, improving the conditions that they are working in in the first place. If we pull up the rule book here, you can see the core game actions with the player aid that's going to be over here just above my head. Writers performing the blue actions, artists the greens, producers the reds, and strategy by any workers of any different type. And the director being one that again can do any different type in addition. Main actions are gonna to correlate to the main parts of the different anime that you need to produce. The blue is the top part, the green is the art in the middle, and then the red is the post-production, if you will, or the hype. And so what you've got going on here, the script, you need three of these acquired for an anime to be able to release. Before you can even do the art section of things, you have to have three of these red pieces connecting. Then you can have up to six of the different art pieces to enhance the anime along with it. There are five different types of the anime right here that are gonna be alongside of it along with all of the different arts that are going to be available to you. So the last phase of that is you're going to be releasing the anime, or it's really the second phase of the game as a whole. The first is using those workers. The second is releasing that, and you can release one anime per round. And based on the trend cards that are available on a turn-by-turn -turn basis, on a round-by-round -round basis, I guess, really, then you're going to be able to get bonuses or victory points based off of that or the popularity that you're scoring because that's really your end game victory. However, you have to remember that as you're recruiting these workers, you also have to pay them money, your salaries at the end of every round, which is the upkeep phase as you then also reset a lot of the things that were grabbed or taken in the first place on the board. And there is going to be a little bit of competition for those worker placement spots. So you have to be careful in where and what order you go in the first place. Additional things along the side here, just above my head, network cards, event cards, opportunity cards in order to score and mitigate along the way fees that you're going to be having to uh, be taken care of from a staff side of things, as well as the uh, strategery option, which gives you more leverage in terms of, well, dealing with some of the mitigation that's going to be necessary. So merchandising, because you know anime is going to have that as well. So this is really kind of cool. Uh, they reached out to me and I was just swamped at the time and I had to apologize for Esther Games and not being able to cover this. But this one has, again, like this is a super good week for Dark Horse games that you've never heard of. And I'm really impressed by this one too, because I think this is doing something really super creative. And I think it's doing it in a way you haven't seen before. And I also trust if we can see right here, where is it? Uh, not this. Where is the video? Cardboard East. Cardboard East. Where'd your video go? Right there. Best anime game ever. If he's talking about it that good, I trust him to cover this stuff. So give his video a look-see and see his thoughts. And if this is up your style of things, or if it's not, either way, go check it out. Speaking of Dark Horse games, again, this is another one that should be fun. This is Robotopia. Euro game with a slight worker placement. It gives me vibes of the previously mentioned IV Studios games in the sense of how you're gonna be placing these robots. Because what you're trying to do is you have four different quadrants of factions of robots that you're trying to uh, rebel with and trying to get them on your side. And you're gonna be trying to get enough influence then to be able to place your influence token in each of those areas. If you're the first one to get all four uh, you know, allied with you, then you win. But how are you gonna be doing that and why I'm comparing it to the previous IV Studios game is because how the workers are different is how they're gonna be placed on the board in the first place. And the other tricky part is that when you place them, they're no longer yours. You lose them. They're lost to the game. They are just robots in the factory. But how you're placing them will then change what resources you are given. And then if you run out of robots as well, you have to make more workers. Does that sound cool? Yeah, because how you're going to be placing them not only is going to change what you're going to get, it's going to change the dynamics that are available to you in the first place. As we pull up the rulebook here, you can kind of see the four different types. The yellows get placed in the center of the space, so they're going to activate every Everything around it potentially. Red are only going to be placed on the edge between two spaces. Blue are going to be at an intersection of three spaces and green 
can be placed any spot where the other ones can be placed as well. The other tricky point is after you've placed all those robots onto the board, then you do the refresh phase where this master robot right there actually moves and he crushes all of the robots that were in that area and you get scraps based on that. But I think it actually, what it does as well is it opens up some of those areas to be able to be utilized again. And how many robots you get depends on how many power generators you have been powering in the first place based on where you place them previously. And that's because you're gonna be getting generators and batteries based on those placements, which then will allow you to make more robots of that specific color. It's just kind of cool. It just seems neat in terms of this mechanic. I love this placement that they're doing down here in the different locations. And then the activation of how you're gonna be doing it as well as building them repeatedly and then uh, gaining the influence and leading the rebellion in order to get the influence in those areas in the first place. So rule book is there. And everything you need to know is on the page. $55 is going to get you the base game. Is there a Deluxified one? Nope. Promo pack as well. And Deluxified is going to be $79. But what does that get you? A little bit better screen printed meeples. And then a little bit of an expansion with double-sided factory tiles to give you some more manipulation and modularity. And if you really want to upgrade that, minis and, well, just deluxifications. So... Again, just kind of a cool looking game, something different. And again, enough video content there to fill your mind with stuff this week. And I'm surprised this one's not funded, but I'm guaranteeing it's probably gonna be funded here in the next couple of days. So give it a look-see, Robotopia. Next up, Treat Please from Solus Game Studios. And what you're doing is sort of a card-driven combo system here in order to earn the most affection. You're playing on a turn-by-turn -turn up to two cards to collect attention and spending energy to buy more cards, more behaviors from a market that's available to you in order to create combos. Spending that attention then that you're getting from those cards scores you affection. That allows you to complete objectives for bonus points and sort of like a Quacks of Quendelenburg, every single round there's going to be some sort of special event that manipulates or changes things as you go do that seven rounds and that's the game i wish there was a little bit more info of the exact dynamics and the exact uh nature of some of those interactions but it's got six thousand dollars and we'll see if it funds it's going for 10 so there you go treat please then we have Psycho Killer with five new expansions coming back. I don't even remember covering this game originally, but it's got $16,000. It's a light card driven style with a little bit of potential take that going along as you're drawing these five Psycho Killers from the deck in order to, well, end the game. And each time you draw them, any injury cards are accumulated via the weapons that you're gonna be holding in your hand. But you're gonna be having cards of other varieties in order to mitigate that because on a turn by turn basis, you get to play as many cards from your hand as you want. But some of those cards are going to allow you to escape or mitigate or not to take the injury that you would from the first place because at the time of the fifth card being drawn from the killer side of things from the deck, that's when the game ends and the person with the least amount of injury points in their injury pile in front of them wins. And so this game is going to give you modifications in five different ways in that regard. The first one, Nightmare Street, essentially says if you don't have a stimulant in your hand, then you have to suffer the penalty of a new rule that this new Nightmare card is going to give you as a whole of how you're going to be able to play your cards. So the same expansion here, Crime Time, basically allows you to pull these Crime Time cards. And instead, when you have to play weapons cards, you get to play them on other people's piles, injuring them instead of injuring yourself. The third one, Occult Classics here, uh, gives you spells. And spells are determined about what happens by dice roll. And so depending on the dice roll, you either get the good spell or the bad spell portion of things. And whether you keep the card or you give the card to someone else, the Bloody Mary, Bloodier and Merrier has two elements of it. It has a little bit of the rules side of things with the tropes that are going to go that are right down here that are going to change the rules and the dynamics of the gameplay. But then they also have the Bloody Marys here, these alcoholic drinks that you throw at people. Again, when they're attacked, you throw them at other people. The last one down here is the bootleg expansion, ex booster module, whatever you want to call it. Basically just gives you blank cards and you get to create your own. So third edition base game and previous editions uh, expansions are available here as well with the previous stuff and all and everything that you might ever want. $33 right here to get three of the expansions, $46 to get all of the expansions. The box set gets you uh, the updated third edition of the base game and everything else new for $66. So again, if you're interested in this and it's just something light, take that style, it's going to be easy to hit the table. Give it a look-see. I remember when this one came around the first time. Uh, this is Monarchs of Camelot. And the, the aspect of this is you're going to have characters that are upgradable and you can upgrade them like depending on which side of the card you use because they're each going to have different strengths on your individual decision cards activating one side or the other and you kind of go asymmetric sort of like the path of light and shadow where you go further and further along those cards as you upgrade them and as it calls here the splaying mechanic 
that is going to be utilized in terms of a gameplay by gameplay action. And the turns are going to be driven based off of these action decisions that are present on your Monarch cards in the first place, activating anything you can along the way. You can see here on the rule book that it gives you a little bit of an example of what the player turns are actually going to entail, giving you whatever available actions that you can, followed by the peril action listed in your journey book as you travel, any locations on your personal goal card, on the scenario rule card, or individual abilities. And so it lays it out very nicely in terms of what you're seeing and how you're doing and what these different actions are. Drawing cards, utilizing the actions to gain more prestige. Give it a look, see 10 victory points is how you win this game. Go read the rulebook. This one, again, is outside of my ability to describe well in a short time frame. But the rulebook, as I just showed you, is there as well as with a first round guide. And they're back, Rhapsody Games, and they're putting out a very solid product. And I think that's why it's funded. There's enough video content as well. I give this one a look-see in terms of the video breakdown as well. It sort of gives me a little bit of the Hall or Nothing vibes in terms of the artwork here, doesn't it? it kind of gives me that aspect of things. So if that is your interest, well, it's funded. We'll see how high it can go. Monarchs of Camelot. Then $12,000 respectively as well. Galen's Games Mint Tin Series. Four head-to-head -head mint tin sized games. Well, that play in a small amount of time. So they're getting four different games here, as you can see, uh, the Battle Bundle and the Strategy Bundle. So depending on your poison, 24 bucks each or mix and match for 40 as a whole. So the first one, Dice Clash, is going to be utilizing dice to not only use them as both defensive as well as counter mechanisms. And when you cannot counter, you flip your card over, can't counter again you lose. Special dice powers can be activated in order to mitigate and use your special ability, and you flip over to your more powerful side, so it's a little bit of a catch-up mechanic, but if that side gets defeated, game over. Second game here is Mint Tin Monster Matchup. You choose two monsters. You smash together a front end and a back end to give two separate abilities that you're going to be uh, combining in order to win. That is not only going to change the life, but also the intelligence of the uh, monster in the first place. You're going to roll dice then essentially to gain energy as you're going to be spending it to use those abilities. And then you go into the boost phase, which is a paper, scissor, rock style of things, which if you do like the fingers, zero to five is going to get you a boost to increase your attack. If you put fist out, you defend, and if you slam your hand on the table, then both players have to reroll, but if you do that and your opponent defends, you lose immediately, so that's crazy. That's gonna be high risk, high reward there as a whole. Then we get down to the strategy bundle here, and this is first up Heritage Farms, where you have chickens, foxes, and corn farmers. You move your boat with your goods to the farm or the market where you have your farmer. Then load them up and then bring them to another card. Drop them off and flip any bonuses. Rinse and repeat as you go through the chickens, the corn, and the foxes. This is the old riddle, right? Where you have to bring the creatures across, but you can't leave like them on one side, like the foxes and the sheep, but you can't leave them on the other side. That's basically the game form of this because chickens eat the corn, foxes eat the chickens, and you need to get two sets of chickens, foxes, and corns to your market. So... Just kind of a cool little twist on that puzzle. And then last up here, down here, we have Verdant, Arizona. And this is more of a drafting heavy take that cutthroat seasoning where you are trying to get the best cacti on display. This has more of the in the footsteps of Darwin style of vibe because you get to move your piece around this market tableau grid and up to two spaces and then take one of the correspondingly adjacent cacti. But where you'd end the turn, that's where your opponent is going to be starting. And so then you're building your little personal tableau there of a King Domino style four by four. The little bonus wrens that might be on certain spaces allow you to manipulate them, but then you're going to be using your columns and your rows in ascending or descending order, as well as color coordination in order to score. If you can't reach a card face up, then you refresh, rinse, and repeat. That's it. Those are the four games. Again, all very stylish and very smooth, but which one is right for you? Are you more of a cutthroat head-to-head -head person? Are you more of a battling person? Which one's right for you? Don't get them all unless you love them all, though. Give it a look-see. Nearly $13,000. So there you go. That is your roundup for this week. Tons of games, tons of dark horses, tons of small indie stuff that is just kind of cool to see that it's doing all well. So we have another big week next week with a few bigger name games launching at the end of the month, including Dice Throne and the Flock Together expansion. Not to mention Ivy Studios with their latest 10, the All Play Quadrilogy, 
And then another one I'll be covering in a multi-game mini review, Pride of Ninja. So again, just kind of a lot of stuff going on. God's Heist was supposed to be here, got moved as well to next month, I think, from Triton Noir. So you'll see uh, when that comes out to a little bit of a different movement style uh, based game that they have been known for in the past. So uh, that's it. I got nothing else going on. I just playing a whole bunch of stuff this weekend and getting a whole lot of stuff done, being productive from a uh, adulting side of things, right? It's tough to get motivated on that stuff, but it's also really good. So let me know what you're looking at. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know where things are at. Hopefully next week as well, we'll have again, another look back must haves and you know what timing wise of uh, another unpopular board game opinions video, because I know you guys like that one. So that's all I got. Thumb subscribe. I'm hitting you up in the comment section down below in case you missed that. So, you know, you're going to get a response. Let me know where things are at with you. I appreciate it. And I have a Patreon. So give them a look-see. Stay classy. Good friends of the channel. I bid you adieu.